You know, before I begin today's message, I, I just wanted to say that I know that inviting someone to church can be very hard. And I know that only 2% of people who go to church ever invite someone to church. What's holding the other 98% back? What's holding you back? Because whatever it is, if it's fear, if it's shame, if it's ignorance, if it's lack of preparation, today I want you to break that chain. The chain that keeps you from inviting someone to church. You are helping someone to come to know the God that can save them. You're not doing any, you're not asking them for anything. You're offering them some hope. So I hope that uh, if hundreds of churches all over this country just have one day where they, they all invite somebody to church, think about what the world will look like. Someone out there just needs a little bit of encouragement. You be that encouragement. Amen. Well, today's message comes from the book of John and the third chapter. I got some verses out of that book. And I also have a verse that I've taken out of 1 Peter, the first chapter. But I want to begin by asking the question, or at least answering a question that gets asked of me all the time. Why don't I worry? People always ask me, why do you seem so calm? Why aren't you worried? And my answer is simply, because I am born again. And what does it mean to be born again? And I kept thinking of ways that I could describe that to this congregation or to anybody. And there was no analogy that worked. I mean, it's so big and it's so powerful that trying to put some other experience, even close, was impossible for me. But I think it's critical that we begin to understand what it means to be born again and how we're supposed to live once that has taken place. We are the sons and daughters of an almighty God. Amen. But I, 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 I just don't want to diminish the importance of the words. You know, the first time the words born and again were put together was by Jesus. And he did it in John, the third chapter, and it was the third verse. Up until then, that phrase had never been seen in the Bible before. Jesus is the first person to actually take these two unique words and bring them together. And in fact, the term born again is only used three times in the New Testament. Amen. Now, that's an expression that we use and say all the time. And yet, it's only three times that Jesus mentions it in the Bible. And before we get really deep into this message, I want you to know that it would be impossible for me to tell you everything that I want to share with you about those words. So I'm going to focus on two or three of the most important points that have to do with the, the, the phrase, born again. And the most important thing that I want to leave you with today, if nothing else, if you remember nothing else from this message, you need to remember that when you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth yeah, yeah. that Jesus is your Lord and Preach. Savior, Preach. God sees you yeah. as different. He, he treats you as a different mm. person than you were before. And I don't want you to miss this. The devil sees you differently as well. There is a target on your back when you see yourself this way. Because the devil, last thing the devil wants is a whole bunch of people living like Christ out there in the world. A whole bunch of people who know they have power over the lust of the flesh, over the temptations, and over the sins that the world just parades in front of us day and night. The devil actually knows, uh, you know, and, and I had to learn this the hard way, and I'm sure many of you have, that there is no difference between the Jesus Christ that is preached in those four Gospels and me. All right. 
No difference. Spiritually, what's operating in you and what's operating in me is the same as what operates in Jesus Christ. So, so what does it mean to be born again? And is there a difference when I say born again Christian? And as I studied, there's a whole bunch of theology about this. And there's a lot of conflicting opinions. You know, sometimes I, I, I start to get confused. And when I feel confused when I'm reading, I quickly lower my head and say, you are not the author of confusion, my Lord. You will bring me to a place of understanding. And I am willing and ready to be taken to that place. So I found all these different descriptions about these things. So I decided, well, you know what? I'm going to look up the definitions for Christian, for born again, and for born again Christians. And I think you'll find them pretty interesting. Webster says that a Christian is one who professes a belief in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, the word professes, that caught my attention. What does that mean? So I looked it up, and it said to declare or admit openly or freely. So what Webster says is that a Christian is a person who declares and admits openly and freely right. that he All or right. she believes in the teachings of Jesus. Jesus. But <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, but I know a lot of people speak, speak. who say they are Christians, yeah. oh, but they're not willing to declare it or to admit it openly right, or freely yes. and say that they believe that everything Jesus teaches and everything the Bible says is true. That's all right. That's all right. Well, how can you call yourself a Christian and not say, I believe everything yes. that Jesus said is yes. true? I believe that this book is the word of God and everything in this book is true. Unfortunately, we know a lot of Christians who never pick up this book. Amen. Or sometimes we know Christians who show up in church on Sundays, and maybe they show up in midweek for an inspiration service or a Bible study. But other than that, this book never lands on their desk in front of them. That's why they don't even know what it says. They don't know what the Bible says is wrong because they're not reading it. If the Bible says it's wrong, then I say it's wrong. Yes. If the Bible says I should do something, then I must do Speak something. Christian. Speak Christian. That's all right. Webster says yes. that a Christian believes in the teachings of Jesus, Jesus and whatever Jesus says is true. Now, the definition of born again is, in Webster's dictionary, of relating to or being usually a Christian person who has made a renewed or confirmed commitment of faith, especially after an intense religious experience. So according to Webster, born again is usually related to Christian persons. All right. Usually. That's the important word in this dictionary description. Usually means that it describes all Christians but it's not limited to Christians. Hmm. That's something uh, most of us never think about. But you're going to understand why when I tell you the definition of a born-again Christian. A born-again Christian, according to Webster, is a person who has returned to or newly adopted an activity, a conviction, or a persona especially with a proselytizing zeal. In other words, someone who has made a decision to follow a particular belief system, the teachings of Christ, and who wants others to be part of that belief system. That's very important. I don't want you to miss this. Born-again Christian has made an, a decision to be born again Based on what he or she believes, do you hear what I'm saying? You have to make a decision that you're born again based on what you believe. 
So I know you're wondering right now, why is she reading these definitions out of Webster's Dictionary? Um, why would I care what man's definition of any of these words is? Why did I give you man's definition? Because when people aren't sure of what a word means, they usually go to the dictionary app on their phone. Or if they're my age, they actually go to a dictionary. Amen. In my case, a Webster's dictionary. And it turns out that I know a little something about dictionary editors. And the way that dictionary editors operate is they study language as it's used. So over a period of time, words are added that were not there before. All right. They actually monitor what words people are using. Peace, peace. And then they determine the meaning based on the use. Are you following me? Right. Let me give you an example. In the late 1970s and in the early 1980s, I conceived my daughter and then my son. And people said I was pregnant. Today, it's called a baby bump. Stay with me here. It's now called a baby bump. How many of you heard the term baby bump? Amen. Well, it's now in the dictionary. And that's how dictionaries come up with definitions for new words. How are they being used? Unfortunately for me and probably many others, every now and again, I will congratulate someone on their baby bump to find out it ain't a baby bump. Amen. And sometimes you might congratulate somebody on being born again and find out that they're not born again. Because it's not based on how we use it. It's based on the Bible and what the Bible says about it. And in particular, it's based on what Jesus said about it because he's the one who came up with the term. And as pastor always says, scripture interprets scripture. Not Webster, not the dictionary app on your phone, but scripture interprets the scripture. So if you're confused, you need to get into your prayer closet, you need to get alone with God and your Bible, and you need to ask him to help me to capture the essence of what you're saying to me in these words. I always tell young people who say, I don't know how to read the Bible. I don't understand the language in the Bible. It's way over my head. I always say, well, the next time you sit down to read that Bible, the first thing I want you to do is to bow your head and ask God to come in to you and to help you to understand the words that you're about to read. God has a word for each one of us. But if you're not there, tell him you need his help. You know, uh, Minister Works talked this morning about prayer. You know, God always answers your prayer. I mean, sometimes he says yes, and you see the manifestation of what you're praying for. And sometimes he says no. And you may not like it, but trust me, there's a manifestation taking place nonetheless. Most of the time, God tells me to wait. God doesn't move when I want him to move. God moves when I'm ready. When I'm ready, not he's ready. He's ready right now. And if I were ready to have what he has for me, he'd give it to me right now. But unfortunately, I still live in the flesh. So I'm not ready for all of the blessings that God has for me. I need to be willing to let him change me. Yes. And that's what being born again is really about. You know, in 2 Peter, in the first chapter, and you could just write this down. It's actually in your programs under the scripture. It, sa um, it says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So I want you to think of God in this context, kind of like the uh, CEO or the president of a company. 
and to think of the holy men who wrote the words in the Bible as secretaries who were taking dictation. It's not their ideas. It's not the disciples' ideas. It's not David's ideas. It's not Moses' ideas. They're God's ideas. And he spoke through the Holy Ghost into these humans so that they could write it down. But the essence is of God. And if that's true, then you better be in communication with God if you want to understand what his word is telling you. Because if you're waiting for man, if you're waiting for preachers to tell you the message that God has for you, you will be very sad. Because we may spark something every now and then. I pray that God uses me to speak to someone in this congregation or someone in the jails, and he often will. But if they don't have a relationship, if you don't have a relationship with God that transcends your relationship with Pastor Billy, Minister Works, Pastor Jay, or any other preacher in this world, then you will never understand what God is saying to you. I will be interpreting for an entire congregation. I may not have a message for you today. I may have a message for the person sitting next to you today. And you won't have to accept, well, I walked away today and I felt like, you know, that message was for somebody else. Well, if it was for somebody else, you ought to be shouting hallelujah because that person probably needed that message and is making you miserable until they get it. Just saying, just saying. What, what Peter is in that passage is saying is if you want to understand the meanings of the words in the Bible, then you have got to get in the spirit. You've got to let the Holy Ghost work in you. That's why when pastor says scripture interprets scripture, that's what he means, which brings us right back to, so what does it mean to be born again? Since it was Jesus who put the words together, then I have to let Jesus tell me what it means, not Webster, Amen. not Pastor Jay, Amen. but Jesus. And that's where today's sermon comes from. John, the third chapter, and you can follow along with me if you want or just listen. It's verses 1 through 7 in the third chapter of John. And the first verse reads, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee that you must be born again. That's Christ who tells me exactly what being born again is. And you need to look at a couple of things from that passage. The word born is a very common word, and it's used a number of times in this context. It means that a husband has deposited seed in a woman's womb and that it results in her giving birth. The word again, however, means from above. The word is used 13 times in the New Testament, and trust me, it took me weeks to count them to make sure that I got the number right. And in each case, it refers to something that starts at the top or starts at the beginning. Everything flows from the top and everything flows from the beginning. There's consistency in scripture. And that's why we use scripture to interpret scripture. 
I had to be willing to look beyond verses 1 through 7 in John, in the third chapter, to get an understanding of what it was that Christ meant. He, Jesus uses the word again to refer to the place which, where the Father lives, and that's in heaven. Jesus is telling Nicodemus that he must be born from above, be born of the Father if he wants to get into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says you must be born of water and you must be born of spirit. What he's saying is that in order to be born again, first you have to be born. Now, I know that seems really obvious, but I want you to think about it because the point is, the point that Jesus is making is that your first birth is not enough to get you into heaven. Something has to happen. From the time that you enter this world through the flesh to your arrival at the seat of the throne of God, something has to happen. And that something is you have to be born of the Spirit. First Peter 1 and 23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That means exactly what it says it means. You know, you don't need to, to be too deep. You don't need to be a theologian to understand that man is corruptible seed. My father was a blessed man. He was a wonderful man. He was a godly man. He was a sincere man. He was a hardworking man. He was one of my heroes. But he was of corruptible seed. My father was not always in the will of his father. And for that reason, I was conceived and born in sin. Being born again relieves me of that and gives me an opportunity to be born of an incorruptible seed because God's seed is perfect. And when he comes into me through the Holy Spirit, I now have the incorruptible seed within me. And you know what, uh, what it says in Romans uh, 10, 9, and 10? We all know what it says is thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Getting born again is a two-part process and you need to understand this. First, you have to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And second, you have to confess with your mouth. Getting born again is not a spiritual activity. It's not a conviction. It's not, a, you know, it's not something you return to. It's not something that you adopt. It's a spiritual change. Now, Jesus says something that's very important to Nicodemus, and I don't want you to miss this. He tells Nicodemus, once you are born again, once you have a new nature, once you have a nature that is like mine, you will be able to do the same miracles that I do. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, right? How many of you believe that? Amen. If you don't believe that you can truly do these works, then you think Jesus is a liar. Because he's very clear when he tells Nicodemus that you will have the same power as the Son of God that I have as the Son of God. He becomes my brother, which means that any power that Jesus had, the power to heal, the power to encourage, the power to change direction in somebody else's life, you have been given that power. And if you don't believe that, then that power is lying somewhere in a puddle waiting for you to figure this out. Everything flows from the top, remember that. That's why it's a two-part process. 
Jesus confirms the very same thing that he told Nicodemus to me and you every single day. He certainly confirms it to me. And I'll tell you where I know it from. In that same book of John, in the 14th chapter, in the 12th verse, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So you got to understand that when Jesus left earth, temporarily, mind you, because he is coming back. And in my estimation, he's still here because he lives in me Amen. and he lives in you. Amen. So his presence yes, through the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Spirit, Beautiful. should be apparent. Yes, there should be something different about right. you. you. You should walk in a manner walk that in. lets everybody walk know in. that I have power. I have power over these situations that used to challenge me. I have power over the idea that I can't get any different. I can't be any better. I can't get rid of these sinful lusts and these urges and desires that I have. See, I believe that I have power. And I try and use that power the way the Father wants me to use it. I don't think there's anybody in here that deludes themselves into thinking that I can speak a winning lottery ticket into your life. Amen. You know, that's got nothing to do with, with the power that I've been given. But I need you to understand that I can speak healing into your life. I can speak hope into your desperate situation. I can speak power into your powerlessness. Amen. I have been given those powers by God himself through his son Jesus and the process of being born again. I know that's true. And the reason I know it is pastor always talks about you have this, uh, you know, intellectual faith. We read about it. We hear about it. We watch a movie that shows God moving in somebody's life. You have experiential faith which means I was the gifted by the Spirit with the answer to my prayer. And I'm going to tell you, if you're not having those experiences, it's because you have not taken hold of your power. All right. God's not going to wrestle you down to the ground and say, this is your power. Use it. He's not in the business of... Uh, speaking into everybody's life the same thing. But there is something important that God has planted inside of you, and I'll tell you how you know what it is. And I often am asked by women who I mentor or who I, uh, you know, Bible study with, they'll say to me, well, how do I know if this is God's will? And for me, it's a very simple matter. If God planted something inside of me, it doesn't matter what the world says. The world told me a long time ago that I was going to have to, you know, uh, be better educated and learn how to do practical things that would generate a, not, a, a lot of money and that I couldn't go with the passion that he had given me. God placed in me this desire to speak. And until I accepted the gift... I wandered around like the Israelites in the desert. Amen. I kept telling everybody, I think God wants me to. I'm pretty sure God told me to, but I was afraid to take the power and to do what God had said to do. And it wasn't until a very wise woman said to me, what have you got to lose? And God speaks to me through people. And this was a woman who... Uh, her faith was so rock solid. Uh, she never doubted God. And she spoke into my life and she said, that desire, that, that, that fever burning inside of you, God put it there. Stop ignoring it. Stop pretending because the world tells you that's not your path. That you have to listen to the world. The devil is the world. 
And he wanted to tell me that I could never be what God told me I could be. You have got to take that power back. Or else, why did Jesus die on that cross? If I was supposed to stay wandering in the desert, if I was never going to have the power that I needed to live a fully realized, born-again Christian life, why did he have to go to the cross? You know, I, know, I don't know about the rest of you, but I know when I saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, I was completely blown away. I remember that we each identify with something different in that movie. And for me, the most powerful scene was watching Mary walking behind her son who had been torn to shreds, carrying a cross up a hill so that he could be crucified on that hill. If that didn't matter, if that wasn't what Christ says it is, my redemption then why did it happen? I believe that God wants my light to shine. He wants your light to shine. That's why Jesus said in Matthew in the fifth chapter, in the 16th verse, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Somebody said to me just the other day, that was a great Bible study, you know, or, or I think the other day, that was a great Sunday school lesson. The devil tells me to say, yeah, thank you. But I know enough to say, to God be the glory. Yes. To God be the glory. Nothing that I do, no power that I have, did I earn? Could I hold on to? if I don't acknowledge the giver of that power. When people say nice things to you, it would be really important for you to say, to God be the glory. And I'll tell you why. Because now they know that you have been changed. Because if you haven't been changed, you get all full of yourself. And you start trying to think that you can do this right. And I have seen mighty, mighty preachers, men of God, be taken out and down because they started to believe that it was them. That they were the reason people were filling up the seats in these mega churches. That it was their words that were changing people's lives. And the minute God takes you that high, that's how quick he'll bring you down. I am very mindful of the fact that everything I have, he gave me. That everything I do, he orders me to do. And that everything that I want, he has for me. So here's the second point. We can walk in the same authority as Jesus when he was on earth. When we know who we are. You need to know who you are. If you were born again Christian, that means that you were born in the spirit. Something happened to you that changed you forever. And now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that your mind and your body immediately lined up with God. Because in my case, that is not true. I still have to live in the flesh. I still have to battle with the same temptations that I had before I was born again. It didn't change the way I think. It didn't change the way I behaved, not automatically. What it changed was my willingness to say yes to Jesus. How many of us know Christians that you look at their lives and you wonder if they're truly a Christian? The Bible says that for us to live by our new nature, we must on purpose put to death. Literally, it says, put to death. Stop doing the things that disagree with who we have become as God's sons and daughters. All right. You know in your heart, just like I know in my heart, when I'm doing stuff that's not pleasing to God, I don't need past ability to tell me. I know. I know. 
and I've got to change. In John 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So I've got to work against the flesh and stay in the spirit. And the third and the final point that I want to leave with you this morning is this. When you are born again, it only affects our human spirits, nothing else. Being born again does not affect your mind and does not affect your body. I beseech you, therefore, and this is from Romans, the 12th chapter, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the mandate. That's the born-again Christian's orders. So how do we put on the mind of Christ? Well, we pull this out and we read it. We pull out the Bible and we read it. And then we read it some more. And then we read it some more. So can a person, you know, the final question which I posed at the beginning is, can a person be born again and not be a Christian? Or can a person be a Christian and not be born again? Webster's Dictionary tells us yes. But what does the Bible say? It doesn't matter what the world says. Not to me. It doesn't matter if everyone agrees with it. It doesn't matter if they wage war against it. What matters is what does the Bible say? And if what the Word says doesn't agree with what the world says, I'm going with the Bible. This is not an easy way to live. Jesus never said it would be easy. But if you're born again and you've turned to the Lord, if you've made yourself a disciple of Jesus, then you are a Christian. And when we understand what it means to be born again, we can be born again. So don't worry about where your next meal is coming from. God is my father. Why would I worry? Don't worry about the clothes that you need. God is my father. Yeah. Why would I worry? Don't worry about having money to pay your rent, to pay your mortgage, to pay your utilities. I am a child of God. My father has all the money I need. My, my, my. And you can follow Jesus' last instruction in Matthew in the sixth chapter. He says, 34th verse, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The reason I don't worry about tomorrow is because I was born again and God is my father.